Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Well, folks, I, I guess they've picked, uh, I guess, two both pres- presidential, national, from a national perspective, have picked their vice president, if you will. And uh, so that's going to be very, very interesting. And and I guess come Monday, uh, they're going to have the conventions that are going to be going on and this, that, and the other. There's going to be all this attention, you know, given to from a national perspective. But realistically, we need that attention here in Oregon. We need our attention in Oregon. We've got our own issues aspect of it. It'll take care of itself to a certain degree. And from an Oregon Voters Digest standpoint, we'll just we'll, we'll, we'll bring you, if you will, the the issues and the, the debates and the, the conventions and whatever. I'll bring some guys in and, and we'll just kind of wrap that around. But but, my, but primarily, 90% of the efforts during this particular time will be on our own issues, okay? Our own elected, elected aspect of it. So on that note, I got with me today, I got a very neat situation for you. I've got uh, one of the gubernatorial candidates. Uh, uh, his name is Bud Pierce and uh, he's running for governor. And I just said Bud Pierce. He's a former Marine like myself. Uh, there's some other things about him that uh, he'll throw out. He's also, a, he, ha- he has a Navy hat too. He went that route when he picked up his bars. When I got out, I went to, I went to the National Guard. So uh, I, I got picked up my bars that way. But it was a, some interesting background. But boy, I tell you, uh, the, 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 the routes we've taken tends to be the, the kind of thing that we need today. I mean, it's a very timely time, but seriously, to have you running for, for governor of the state of Oregon. Thank you, Bruce. I think Very it's a great good. time. I'm I'm excited about you're it. Not uh, a good reception. I have not. This yeah, is my. I've won one election. I have run really? for one election. Oh, it's wow. great. I haven't. Uh, I've done medical politics from the outside, wow. trying to make medicine better for wow. people. But uh, nope. Uh, one election. You, you, that's you, it. That's just one two. election. I yep. won several. I know. But but I, but I won by losing. There you go. If you understand there what I'm you saying. go. Sure. I'm, saying, you I'm able to deal with the issues. Mm-hmm. That's right. I know, and you learn everything right? every time. Well, Bud, why don't we start off first by, by talking to Bud about Doug? Okay. You know, like uh, how you got to this particular point. But before you got to that particular point, you know, go through the normal peace aspect. But I'm very interested, and in, because I had the opportunity to chat with you a little bit more about your, your time in the military and this, that, and the other, and how you got into your profession and whatever. I think sure. that has a part of that, right? Sure. So snapshot. So yeah, I, I was yeah. born actually in war-torn Germany after World War II. My mom survived the Battle of Berlin as a teenager. My dad came over after the war in the Berlin airlift, helped rescue her from starvation, all the wow. German citizens. And he was an older guy. And uh, a lot of the German boys had been killed. So they got married. I was actually born overseas. Mm-hmm. And then I grew up outside of an Air Force base, small farming town. Uh, learned the value of a tight-knit family. There was only the four of us, no extended family. Mm-hmm. And dad died when I was uh, 14. Next year I'm out working as bag boy, learned the value of work, uh, wow. the dignity of work is so important. And then went off and was good at school, went off to medical school and then always wanted to serve. Right. So I got through the second year of medical school and I had some time off before I started some graduate school and I said, I want to serve. I want to see if I'm good enough to be a Marine. Oh. So I went to MCRD as enlisted Marine. <laughs> I was like the oldest, I was the oldest guy there. I was oh. 23, everybody else was 17. Oh. Wow. And I uh, did that for six years out of the uh, Encino Reserve Unit and Headquarters Unit, Basic Infantry. Uh, the great thing about the military, just like growing up outside of an Air Force base, is how people come together and work together. So we had all races, all religions, all backgrounds, and we were going to be Marines. And mm-hmm. that was our unifying call. We, and we lived together, mm-hmm. and we worked together, and we got along together. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was, it's so impressive because you have that common cause, and as we've discussed, you have that structure. You know where you fit in. Mm-hmm. We don't have a lot of these difficulties mm-hmm. we seem to have mm-hmm. outside of the military. Um, got my MD, went uh, was in medical training, and then they had a program. If you wanted to be an officer in the military, you could yeah, serve. Right. That's right. And you spent summers uh, in in uh, serving in the military, and then you would be willing to be called up if there was a war. Right, so I right. went from E5 to O3. That was kind of cool because when, when I went to Pendleton, I went from a from a pup tent to uh, officers' quarters. Wow. That was kind of wow. cool. Wow. And, and again, the same thing you feel is that 
common purpose right, in the right, Navy, right, right. Uh, people working together, right, right. you fit in, right. it doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, your, right. your new identity is, is your cause for the mission. Right. But you know, and, and, and as we were, and, and we did have a few glitches, as you know, because sure. when you got in boot camp, oh, yeah. of it, I'm sure you're familiar with those Pugo sticks. Right? Oh yeah, sure, remember sure. Those, oh yeah, sure. And very familiar with the Quantity huts, right? Absolutely. I don't yeah. know which one you were in. But yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, mine was 212. You remember your 2053. Two? Look at you. 2053, <laughs> where have you been? Oh, wow. Yeah, there you go. Wow, those are some good days. Uh, those you know? are good numbers. And, you know, in today when we're having these issues with, um, i.e., being together and mm -hmm. this, that, and the other, you know, the, the word that comes up is assimilation. Mm -hmm. you, you hear it now yep. more than ever about the fact that we should assimilate, mm -hmm. and various cultures within our own country, within our own state, for that mm -hmm. matter, are having problems trying mm -hmm. to assimilate. But right. the military board was really, that was the assimilation. Correct. Because, and then the idea of the draft, that mm -hmm. was kind of like part of it. I mean, we really, this country really benefited. Mm -hmm. From that kind of assimilation, all the men, if you will, were drafted, mm -hmm. if you will, and and uh, you you spent the two years, and then you did your own thing, mm -hmm. and uh, there wasn't that many issues. I realized there was Jim Crow, mm -hmm. various areas mm -hmm. of the state, but the bottom line is that the majority were basically ever assimilated. And I was in the volunteer force, you the volunteer. so everybody Same wanted here. to be there. Yeah, yep, and cool. again, That's but right. once you go in there, some of your you don't give up your identity That's and right. who you yep, are, yep, right. but again, the cause becomes greater right. than your individualism, right. and that's really what it's about. You're still an individual, you still right. have your roots, you still have yeah. your family, yeah. but can you meld together for that great common that's cause? Right. And I think, again, as, as Oregonians, if we yeah. can come together toward, around that cause of a better state, a greater mm -hmm. state, with so mm -hmm. much work to be done, mm -hmm. so much work, mm -hmm. and if we can work together, mm -hmm. then again, some of these differences can bring variety and innovation, mm -hmm. but they don't have to tear us apart. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that's a struggle is, are we are we on common goals? Are we working together? Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. where I think most of the uh, changes can be made. Well, I think Oregon needs to take advantage of that. Absolutely. I mean, you got the plan, Absolutely. if you will. Absolutely. And it's not to say, and as you know, uh, my listening audience, you know that I will always invite the other side. Absolutely. And hopefully um, I will basically get us strong points or whatever. But, but that, too, is, is a situation that we need to re respond to. Yeah, we'd love to have I mean, uh, Governor Kate Brown right there. Oh, really? And we'd be you, talking you, about you, I think that'd be you, fabulous. You'd have a problem I'd be, I'd I mean, be we're, here. We're the we only community person in the, in the state of Oregon, right here. Absolutely. In fact, she lives, be, you know, and she lives here in Portland. She could come down one afternoon on would a Sunday you? afternoon. I'd be here. I'll drive would you, up would you, would you Absolutely. Oh, wow. This we would be good. So, here. Kate, hey, look, come on over. I mean, I, I've known her, too. And in fact, mm -hmm. she's, a, she's, she's a neat lady. She is. You know, very neat she person. Is. So, Kate, please come over. We, 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 we'll do that with you. And Absolutely. Her, but I'll do her first like we did, like mm -hmm. I'm doing you now. And then we'll just kind of get together and That's, talk about the issues that we have. That'd be great. Across the board. Absolutely. Sounds great. Sounds great. I'll, okay, I'll be here. Okay. okay. Now, th th there's another part of your mm -hmm. life that I'm your commander in general. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about her for a minute. How'd oh, yeah, mean, Selma. So you Selma and I uh, met at UCLA. She was a dental student. I was an MD-PhD student. And we were married. We've been married for about 35 years. And she, uh, while I've been off doing my medical career and everything, right. she made, uh, she actually worked and supported the family when I was in training. Mm -hmm. And then we came up to Oregon. And uh, she had been raised in a family where her mom always worked. Mm. So her mom always worked. And she wanted to be there for her kids. So she stepped away from her dental career. Raised our children, Michael and Christina, who are adults now. and uh, But at the same time, she kept her hand in by doing a charity dental work. So a lot of children's dental work. And when we had the Mission of Mercy come down to Salem, uh, that's a, a program that's primarily in Portland, mm -hmm. in which there would be uh, uh, several hundred dental professionals, and you take care of, of a thousand or two thousand people with no dental insurance. She was a leading force for that. Wow. So she's done a, done a lot of that. And also, wow. she's on the Oregon Community Foundation, the OHSU Foundation, wow. and just done a lot for the community. So she's, uh, and she is the bedrock of our family. Right, so I can awesome. go off and do medicine and politics right, and all that. Right, she right. is the glue. Wow, fantastic. She is the glue. I've got a similar glue. Yep. I understand yep. that. Okay. She's great. Now, let's talk about yourself. How'd you get into business? And what, what, what? Well, I always wanted to be a doctor Okay. since I was five. Okay. And I kind of went on the course. And then when I went off to U UC Riverside, they had a tie-in with UCLA. And um, I, I started working as an orderly. And I just wanted to take care of people. And somehow, life broke my way. I had lots of people helping me. I had great education. I actually have two doctorates uh, and a bachelor's degree. I, I graduated from high school in 1974, finished in 1994, 20 years wow, later. Man. So 18 to 38. And that whole education and training only cost me $10,000, which because the taxpayers of California at that time heavily supported the University of California. So my last year of medical school, my most expensive year, 1987, was $1,500. And I learned that great lesson that you can take a janitor's kid, 
a complete nobody in the world wow. that no one cares about wow. other than your parents and people that know wow. you and society can invest in you and then you can be trained up and you can do a lot of good in society i think that's something that's always in my mind is let the regular people have a chance mm -hmm. let their children have a chance mm -hmm. to be educated and trained and become leaders in society if you if you have the ability so mm -hmm. i things broke my way. So I came up to Salem because I want to be in private practice and they had a real need for doctors. If you take places like Portland that yeah. are highly desirable, mm -hmm. everybody wants to work there. Right, right, when right. you go one community, not quite so desirable okay. to Salem's and we have a lot of resources. So I joined a private practice. It uh, took off and got enlarged. We now have about four sites, 75 employees, all private practice. Our gross revenue, it's mostly cost and expense, about $40 million. million so are you the business. principal person? So I'm the senior partner. You're the senior partner. And we've always done it as ah. when you bring new people in, you uh, assimilate them and give them right. quality. Right. So we do right. that. So I've kind of driven this a lot. But but once we bring in a new partner, it's all of ours. So we, mm. we all own it equally. Wow. We share in it equally. Wow. So there isn't the higher and the lower. Group. Wow. Wow. So now you, you're you feeling as if to say, well, gee whiz, I've organized this situation. I'm part of a team. And uh, everyone knows their job. And now I'm going to see if I can resolve some of the issues that I've always felt very strongly about. A passion. Yeah, and I and I got involved with medicine politics about 20 years ago because okay, 20 when, you, years ago. Yeah, when you, you come into town, they say, well, you should join the medical society okay, because okay. you should know the other doctors. Okay. At that time, the local medical society got heavily involved in politics because the political process was weighing on us and changing medicine, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we're in Salem. Mm -hmm. So first you meet the mayor, and then you meet the local official, yeah, Peter yeah. Courtney and those people. Yeah, yeah. And then um, if you want to, you get involved with state politics. And then if you're chosen, you get to be the president of the medical association. So I was. And that got me into the federal politics oh, and the state wow, politics. Wow, so you're watching wow. and you're watching our Republican Party and it's struggling. And I, I think of the Republican Party as the legacy Republican Party. Okay, okay. I think about Abraham Lincoln, the yeah, great, yeah. the first great president, yeah, right, right. freedom and unity, right, right, freedom right, and unity. Right, I think right, about right. Teddy Roosevelt right. saying for the regular person, right, right. the everyday person, clean right. water, clean air, clean food. Right. To think about the environment with him starting the national parks right. and he busted up the big businesses and monopolies mm -hmm. if they were harmful mm -hmm. big monopolistic mm -hmm. and harmful break them up mm -hmm. small size them then you think about mark hatfield just yeah, mark, a great yeah. moral leader yeah. against vietnam but also against racism early 50s passed anti-discrimination mm -hmm. in housing mm -hmm. when he took an african-american to portland guy mm -hmm. couldn't get lodging right. you see a picture of him yeah. outside yeah. of the capitol uh outside the senate office with the naacp and then tom mccall Yep. The greatest okay. environmental yep. governor yep. in the history of our, of our country. Yep. That's the legacy Republican Party that we need to embrace and bring back to today. So I'm sitting there thinking after 2014, wow. Dennis Richardson, wow. love the man, uh, wow. lost again. I go, well, right. I'm right. going to run. I'm going right. to run in 2018. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah, going to go. Yeah. I'm going to go. Gonna I'm going gonna, to bring this well, back. Well, gee, and then 2016 happens. Yeah. Dr. John Kitzhaber resigns in 2015, and I make a run, wow. and I present this to Republicans, and I present this to the citizens of Oregon, and they said I win the primary. Wow. So I'm going wow. forward from the primary awesome. to the General, awesome, so I'm awesome. going, I'm going. Well, I'm interested in that last part, mm -hmm. that, that first part you were sharing mm -hmm. about, about the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. What happened? In we Oregon. lost our way. In we, just, Oregon. we just lost our way. I don't know what happened. I mean, we have that great history and tradition between 1875 and 1950. Right. What we happened? won 90 percent of the elections. I mean, what I, 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 it beats me. I, you just read it, and somehow we moved away. Somehow we got off track. We moved away from responding to the people's needs and yeah. just went off in another direction. I wasn't, I'll say I wasn't here, I was in California training, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I have no idea how we got so off track, right. but we got off track. And when parties lose all the time, the problem isn't the people, it's a party. Right. And we need to change and we need to look at ourselves in the mirror and say like, why are not, why are people not responding to our message and our ideas? And you know, what is the problem here? And then what you can do is always, if what you're doing now isn't working, go back to what did work. Yeah, yeah, go back yeah. to your great successes. And again, we can never go wrong if it's Abraham Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, Mark Hatfield, and Tom McCall, embrace their yeah, their approach, yeah, their yeah. thinking, their ideology, yeah, and bring yeah. that to the table today. Yeah, you know, and and, and well, right up front with in the core, I'm sure you're familiar that 10 percent, right? Mm -hmm. You've got that 10 percent running the piece right now. Yeah, it's sure. unfortunate. Sure. The mindset. Sure, sure. I mean, sometimes people don't have any intention for doing it, but yep. the fact of the matter is, yep. it's it's really a sad note because. Mm -hmm. Is as if to say the Republican Party is just for the rich. Mm -hmm. and you hear this all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we're anti, we're, we're pro poor, mm -hmm. that type of stuff. Yeah. All the negative stuff. Yeah. And even when I think about the immigration aspect mm -hmm. of it, it was the, the, the first the first blanket, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. uh, pardon, if you mm -hmm. will, uh, uh, identifying these people as citizens. Sure. 
Ronald the Reagan. Republican Party, Ronald yeah, Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Yeah, and when you think about the original Republican Party after the Civil War, I know yeah, it's going oh yeah, way oh back, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, they looked at it as business success yeah, for yeah. the purpose of high wages. Yeah. In other words, if businesses can be successful, we're not interested in business success, yeah. period. Yeah. It's so that people can have great lives, yeah. i.e. the workers. Yeah. And we were always for the small. We were always for the small business. We were always for the regular folk. And again, right. that's that Teddy Roosevelt right, deal. Right, right. But uh, parties can get off track. And I would say the Democratic Party has gotten off track a lot too. I'm not going to pick on yeah, that. Yeah, day. I'm not yeah, running yeah. as a Democrat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, and the votes. You look at you look at Donald Trump. In many ways, he's a protest vote right, because right. every first front line Republican politician was up there, and the Republican voters said no. Yeah, yeah. And then you look at uh, Bernie Sanders running against Hillary Clinton, at least in this state. And Bernie Sanders really running as an outsider. Yeah, right, he's right, exactly. not even a Democrat. Yeah, 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 and right, the majority exactly. of Democratic voters exactly. said Hillary Clinton. Yeah, no, yeah, Bernie yeah, Sanders. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I don't like what people are right. doing. So, so I, I, I think there's again that strong sense that the political class isn't really listening nor delivering mm -hmm. for regular people. Because mm -hmm. what regular people need, obviously, is they need to be safe. Mm -hmm. They must be safe. They need to have good paying jobs and a low cost of living mm -hmm. because part of freedom is having your own money in your own pocket so you yeah. can live the life you want to live mm -hmm. and it has to do with training and education and career technical and and all those things mm -hmm. housing costs and then the final part is freedom mm -hmm. and the republican party always must stand for freedom free to be who you are truly are in your heart mind and soul and when disputes arise i would argue that the best way to do it is to bring those together who are in dispute mm -hmm. and ask them to solve it. And if they can't bring in people that can help you mediate it and solve mm -hmm. it. So you solve them one at a time. Because we have great laws against discrimination and hatred and all that. I mean, the laws, there are plenty of laws. I and mean, we don't like laws. But to get people who have differences of opinions and beliefs to work together and live together, when they're in dispute, bring them in mediation. And then the ultimate way to get people to live together, as we stated earlier, was get them to work together. Just like mm -hmm. you and I were in the military, mm -hmm. you're not thinking mm -hmm. about how you're different. It's mm -hmm. how, how you, how you, right. you know, right. serve the military. Right. So those are, I think, the ideas that are ideas of the Republican Party of the past can be brought forward today and, and be successful. Well, you know, I, I'm trying to sort of comparing notes with reference to the whole issue of assimilation mm -hmm. in our education system. Mm -hmm. You know, because suppose that we were supposed to have the top, we, we responded, if you will, to the formative years mm -hmm. early on, sure. if you will. But, but what we were talking about and what you're talking mm -hmm. about, and you can sort of relate it to, i.e., the whole issue that we're having somewhat mm -hmm. today about the black and the white situation, mm -hmm. that was ta it's not being taught in school. The history is yeah. not being taught in the schools. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then you hear, the, you hear little notes and whatever, and I don't know, maybe you can share this thing with me, but about the idea that uh, Texas was the one that sort of uh, signed, signed off on the books. Yeah. And that's why we've not gotten into education. Any, can you share? Well, what, this, let me just, yeah, let me no, just no, talk about talk education about as we view that, because yes. I think education is critical. So yeah, I think that, that is it. Public education is yes. a conservative value. And I think people get confused about what conservatism is. Yeah, that's, what, conservatism what is really means, I like the way Abraham Lincoln, our first okay. Republican president, right. defined He said, trusting what has proven to work in the past. Not being willing to learn and bring in something new, but not being easy, easily dissuaded mm -hmm. from what worked in the past that has a proven track record, mm -hmm. because when you change it, it may be wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's, again, and the bad side of conservatism would be if you're rigid and you can never change. But the good news is, is before I'm going to change, prove it to me. So let's talk about public education. It's a conservative value. It started in the colonies three, four hundred years ago, where it's felt that public education for every person was very important to, to allow them to develop in a, into an adult. And so that's a conser great public education is a conservative value. And mm -hmm. that's something that needs to be remembered by conservatives. Um, when we talk about a person and allowing them to develop into their full potential, which is what education really is about at its core, full development of the potential of that human being. The, the most important time is actually nine months in the womb. Mm -hmm. That's a critical time because mm -hmm. if you're in the body of a woman that is diseased or has substances or something in their body, that can harm you as you develop mm -hmm. inside your, your mother's body. And the next most important time is the first two years of life, where it turns out that your nervous system is developing and, and you're coming together as a person. And, what's hap and what you need at that time is to be in good shelter, so it's warm and dry and you have food and all that, but you need to be held and loved and caressed and talked to and petted, and just, 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 mm -hmm. you know, just loved. And if you have that part right, the first nine months and the first two years, you're probably going to be okay as a human being. You can even get behind, you can have some lack, but you can catch up. If you get those, that initial part wrong, 
you can never catch up because you're damaged in your development. Mm -hmm. So we have to focus on, on women that are, that are pregnant. So if they're having trouble, we need to rescue them like right now to rescue that child. We need to make sure the first two years there's a nurturing environment. It has to be, the primacy has to be on the child's development within the context of a family. And then we can start the formal education process. And the formal education process needs to be put into place with great teachers that are motivated, that are great leaders in whatever classroom mm -hmm. setting, that know their subject material, mm -hmm. that have authority and accountability, have some flexibility with the budget, hopefully teach children in a affluent suburb of Portland or affluent area of Portland different than maybe an immigrant children because they're a different place in, in life. They need to maybe adjust the curriculum and such. Um, and then as you go along and you see uh, children's abilities, their strengths and weaknesses, allow them to, to develop those. My dad could build anything. He could watch someone build a wall or a house, he could study a little bit and build it. And he tried to teach that to me, I can't build anything. Mm -hmm. I have 10 left thumbs. Mm -hmm. So if our society was based on building things, I would be a failure. Now I'm, I'm good at, at medicine and, and intellectual things. So what we need to have is a wide variety of options. So for the kids that seem to have the, the tools to be teachers and financial planners and doctors and, and investors and lawyers, great. But all those other great jobs, important jobs, the things that make things and build things and repair right, things, right. the career technicals we're talking mm -hmm. about is we're talking about measure IP sixty measure ninety eight IP sixty five, that that career technical, the the shop kind of things or the practical things so important to allow these to bring back to really the middle class. Mm -hmm. Because the middle class is paying people very well for technical skills to build things and make things and create our infrastructure. And that's what we've given that up. Mm -hmm. and, and what we've done by giving that is, is ruining the middle class. In terms of how we put our curriculum together and all that, I like to trust states that have done it. I, I always think about Oregon. Well, what is Oregon? Does Oregon have to figure it out on their own every time? I mm -hmm. go, no, well, look at Iowa. Iowa's been doing curriculum development and testing of students mm -hmm. since the 30s. Mm -hmm. They have a proven track record. Mm -hmm. Indiana, long track record. Massachusetts, long track record. We don't have to come up with some kind of Oregon-centric plan. We can say, this is a group that did it the best. Let's kind of copy theirs yeah. and call it Oregon's. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think government has to be very practical on funds. When you get creative, when you say, well, I want to develop this all new process for education or training or curriculum, and no one's done it before, but I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. Get ready to spend lots of money, and, mm -hmm. I, and I think that's the wrong way to go. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as you've gone through this simulation, mm -hmm. you've gone all the way from point A to point B, mm -hmm. point Z, if you will, mm -hmm. but at the beginning, mm -hmm. during the days of Lincoln aspect of mm -hmm. it, we left one entity, one entity out, mm -hmm. the Holy Shift Slavery. Yeah. Yeah, so, the they, they were fighting that 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 yeah, soldiers war. Yeah. Had that been that was not a part of that, unfortunately. And yeah, I think what happened? Educate people about what that was, and and talk about it. Just yeah. be just just talk about it. Yeah. So that we can, because a lot of folks basically saying, "Well, gee, I don't want to go back to that. I just don't want to even talk about right, it." Right, right. I understand. What but you're we have. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I see what, what you're what saying. Do you so think? yeah, so my my thinking is is that if President Lincoln had been assassinated, we would have done a lot better That's right. as a society. That's and right. I think that we completely lost sight of that. And I and I like if you go to the Lincoln Memorial and look oh, yeah. oh, at yeah. the second inauguration oh, yeah. speech. Oh, yeah. And he and he pretty much, if you read that, it says. I believe that the it's possible that the death of the innocents on the Civil War battlefields are a price we're paying for the for the sin of slavery, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm, sin of slavery. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I was when I, when I think about when I think about you know my view, you were talking yeah, about yeah, racism, yeah, yeah, right, fairness, right, happy right, right, So right. I, so I obviously I come from a Christian background, and in, in the Christian teaching that I've always received since I was seven years old is that equality in God's eyes. So it, there it, there's no stretch for me to see equality in human beings from, from all our eyes. So so again, there's complete equality in, in, in my teaching, my mind, and my soul. I had the great advantage of um, growing up outside of an Air Force base where we had all kinds of people, yeah, all kinds of yeah, ethnic groups yeah. and racial groups. And uh, we came together, we played together, we worked together, we were on sports teams together, we competed against each other. When I went off in California to UCLA Medical School, great African-American doctors I worked with. There's one up here, Tony Riddick, who's just fabulous, yeah. as good as I've ever seen. Yeah. So in my mind, and my model is, is that that's how it should be. Now, if you look at our history, obviously it hasn't been that way. And after the... Um, the uh, Ferguson events uh, and the outward display of, of hatred that how we haven't gotten, you know, that if you look at, at the components of racism, we've done a lot to get rid of the, the legal racism, which unfortunately well, yeah, the government had in place. The government right, had in right, place right, after right, the Civil right, War. Right, so right. first thing that should have been there, obviously. Right. Um, and, you, and that needs to be gotten rid of. But then how do you get people 
to not hate each other. Yeah. And so I think, again, the, the goal there is, and the key there is, as a 59-year-old going through this life, is have people work together and live together and share projects together and be in the military together and just join their lives. And as you talk about assimilation, join their lives together yeah, in, yeah, in common, yeah. common cause. And then what happens is people aren't afraid of one another because a lot of times this whole idea of, of, of a lot of, I think, our thoughts about how races can't agree is there's a tremendous fear factor. Mm. You don't know people and you're afraid of them. And when people are afraid, they're irrational and they make all kinds of bad decisions, all that kind of stuff. So obviously what we needed to do after the Civil War, if we had moved at that point and started yeah, our process yeah, yeah, yeah. of equality and assimilation and fairness and equal opportunity, we might be there now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we did, we, we really started yeah. probably kind of in the 60s. In the 60s, you and I were around, that's where legal discrimination racism came down. Legal and a lot of the, most of those barriers are yeah. down there. The legal, it's hard, it's hard well, to legally well, the discriminate. Issue, the legal rights to men, right. all that other right. good stuff yeah. was good. But now, again, the next step is is how do we end hatred, racial yeah. hatred? And again, I'm convinced that the way we do it is not so much as living next door to people that aren't the same as us but actually having a life with people that are different than us. And that has to do with working and spending time together and knowing each other. Because when you're on a great project with someone, a hard task and you accomplish it together, you're just happy that they're there with you and that people are there with you and you celebrate it. And then you look at people's differences from you as being strengths rather than weaknesses. So I think that's where we have to go. I think it's the work. I think that we have too many people that are not actually not working. And that, yeah, the yeah, numbers I have in my head is we have 4 million Oregonians, we have 3 million of working age, we have 2 million jobs, we have 1.5 million full-time jobs. There's a million people of working age that don't work. Mm -hmm. When I talk to, uh, because there's nothing for them to do, yeah. uh, I talk yeah. to NAACP leadership in my town, President Benny Williams and his wife Marilyn, great pastor, they're going to have a program tomorrow with the, with the police and the, and the community to try to keep the tension down with all the things happening. They say, bud, the worst thing in the world is when our teenagers, 16, 17, 18, can't get a job because they yeah. need to learn how to work as adults when you're a teenager because that's how you learn to fit in into adult life. Can't get a job. Can't get a job. You think about all the people, if you look at the disparity in um, employment yeah. uh, in, in middle age life, unacceptable. And then finally, I would argue that we need to do a lot more to encourage our seniors to keep working. A couple of reasons. One is our society is getting older. So we just need more people to work. And actually, if you look at the, the most important indicators of mental and physical health, it's actually having a job, a purpose in life. You take that away from people, and they lose their mental health and their physical health. So I would say if, you, if you're a senior and you can work and you're 75 years old, I wouldn't have you pay any state yeah, income yeah, tax. Yeah, you're yeah. a blessing. Mm -hmm. So at starting at age 65, I'd give you 10% off your income tax mm -hmm. every year. Mm -hmm. And if you work beyond 75, because you are, you are a gift. Mm -hmm. So by getting people, getting this economy going, and getting people to work together and needing everybody's effort and thinking about the when I think about the Marine Corps is and we've talked about this say what you mean mean what you say do what you say you're gonna yeah. do and yeah. leave no one behind yeah. every Oregonian yeah. is part of the Oregon family and I don't want any I don't it doesn't matter if it's if what race or religion or belief system I want every Oregonian to be part of the Oregon team and part of my team and your team and we're all going to have success again we don't leave anyone behind Marines don't leave anyone behind the battlefield and if I'm governor we don't leave anyone behind in the in our prosperity our safety and our freedom we're just it's not going to be allowed we're just not we're not going to accept that well that's a that's a, that's, a, that's a very defining piece and then in fact uh, Hopefully the folks will understand in the, in the kitchen. That's why I've got you on, and we're sure. talking about this sure. piece and and how we both identify uh, as um, as assimilators, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. And then from a historical standpoint, uh, I will say this to you that um, it's still there. You know, the Lincoln era is still there. Mm -hmm. And so, how do we how do we get out of it? Because now here we are in a very progressive society. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have three categories. Mm -hmm. We have the rich, mm -hmm. the middle class, and the poor. Yeah, we have rich, the rich uh, some, and we have yeah, big, yeah. poor, and you middle know, class pretty hollowed out. Yeah. 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 But, but in the African-American mm -hmm. community, mm -hmm. they do have rich, mm -hmm. middle class, and poor, but they're all coupled in, they're yeah. all grouped in the poor area. Yeah. You see I agree. I mean? And that's why they sort of agree yeah. as to what's going on today 
Uh, you can talk to some of these mm -hmm. folks in these upper areas mm -hmm. aspect of it, and they'll give you one answer there. Sure. But then over here, the, 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 this, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll come up with another mm -hmm. answer, depending upon who right. you are. Right, you know I understand. And that's why we're having this discussion. That's why it's so important that they understand yeah. that we dropped the ball. We dropped oh, the ball absolutely. in that aspect absolutely. of it. And it was the Republican Party that came up with the civil rights deal. Absolutely. Whole nine yard. But for some strange reason, we didn't follow up on it. Uh, no, I agree. And we keep coming back to the table, I agree. As actually putting it on mm -hmm. table, mm -hmm. and then walking away from mm -hmm. it. It was almost like the the, the whole issue with immigration, mm -hmm. the same yep. thing. Yep. We we in initiated it, then we walked away from it. Mm -hmm. We're sitting up in the Congress in the right. same boat, and right. we walked away from it. And then the right. other entity picks it up, right? You know, and you go back and forth. But but it's something that needs to be understood, and that's why we're having this discussion, because people need to know. What really happened? But now, what are we going to do? Right. So from like yeah. Attitude. So going back. So what I would think about. So number one, if I'm governor, uh, we're going to have an incredibly diverse administration okay. and the top okay. people. Okay. That's one thing you can do. Oh, yes, okay. You can do that because you bring in other voices and you bring in other talent and you bring in role models, frankly. And okay. I and I don't and I don't mean having. Latinos or African Americans no. or or Asians right. in token positions. Right, I mean right, real right. positions right, of right, leadership, right, right, not right, like right, right. not right, just right, on right. civil rights. I mean right. real positions. So you right. do that. Number two, you really got to focus on that education and training. You well, that's, really that's, absolutely that's, that's, must do, do that because think, do that think, is the key. That's why I, I had any success in life. If I had been educated or trained, it doesn't matter. And again, society gave that to me, and right. I want the same thing for all children. Right, right. Uh, in fact, uh, hopefully within your again, we can deal with this issue of educating the kids, especially the ones that are just getting into the system. Mm, yeah, absolutely. That, that education, that doing those formative years. Yeah, absolutely. That should be an area where all cultures are respected if they live in this country. Yeah, absolutely. In the book that's introduced to these kids mm, absolutely. at the beginning. We're not doing that. I agree. So hopefully this is something yep, you yep, might, yep. You're, you're the education czar. Yeah, so you're, I, I, you're going to be the education czar I'm aspect of it. That. And so that. consequently as a result of that, hopefully we can standardize the whole deal. Yeah. And everybody's getting something. That, that could be part of an assimilation. Mm -hmm. That would be huge. Then we could get away with things like, because the moment you make the point of a, a person makes the point of a gang, mm -hmm. they think black. Mm -hmm. Well, before the before we mm -hmm. we we we, uh, we passed the marijuana law, mm -hmm. when you say drugs is black, mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? We got to get away from that piece. Mm -hmm. Sure, we have our ills, but the fact of the matter is, it's not putting a person in the situation that we got in the situation that we are right, right. now. And I think uh, too, there's a lot of potential for African American entrepreneurship. Uh, really, I think I think there's amazing I creative and talented people, and a lot of times it's cost and lack of capital. Mm -hmm. right? Just frankly, is yeah, yeah, yeah. so you take people and you say, well, let's give you some encouragement. Let's say that uh, if you on your first thirty thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars on profit, we give you half the tax rate on you as an individual to give, make you take that chance. Because you and I know a lot of times mm -hmm. you start a business it doesn't work, mm -hmm. and even more important than that, you say to local community banks, you say we can for small entrepreneurs. Of, of of any group that uh, needs capital will under the state maybe will underwrite a third of that loan mm -hmm. so that if you make a loan and push it out and it goes on you're not going to lose the full amount because mm -hmm. again getting capital into the hands of people that want to start a business that have a great idea can't get the basic seed money going and that way you still have the vetting by the private sector mm -hmm. where the private sector is not going to throw the money mm -hmm. away but they'll say yeah, i can take a chance on your project because mm -hmm. i have some loan guarantee and i think you're going to be successful mm -hmm. so i can do that so i think that idea of turning loose the creativity and the ability of people that don't have any access to capital mm -hmm. and then obviously the cost of starting business has to be a lot lower mm -hmm. and the and the the rigmarole about getting a business going needs to go away. So that if you have a great idea for a great product or service or food or mm -hmm. restaurant, it's pretty much, it just gets done and you go. It can't be that you're just spending, mm -hmm. uh, spending all your time and energy on consultants to make the right, issue right, go. Right, right. I think that's like, I think that's huge because there's a lot of ability that's being kept down because of really lack of access to mm -hmm. capital and mm -hmm. rules that are cumbersome. Mm -hmm. So I really, you got to really turn people loose. You know, we, 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 we in this state, we, mm -hmm. we got involved in that whole issue at mm -hmm. one point in time. Mm -hmm. And uh, SBA got in this whole mm -hmm. idea of sunsetting the law. Mm -hmm. you, you, you were able to participate with the, with the perks mm -hmm. for a certain period of mm -hmm. time. Right. And then you were left to go out on your own. Right. But in, in other markets, we kept it. Yeah. And, and to me, I think that has some issues. We need to kind of maybe, maybe adjust a bit from the standpoint of saying, okay, besides saying, here's the sunset law, mm -hmm. you have to pay back. Correct, correct. You know, pay back from the standpoint sure. of hiring folks mm -hmm. from the community. Oh, I mean, yeah, sure. I, yeah. To pay off your, your yeah. debt. That's, so an to that's another way to get the community going right, and get right. people working on it. And again, getting those great, as you're describing, public-private partnerships. Yes. So you have some public money, right. but, but the public isn't, isn't right. creating the project. Right, right. But you have some capital in there 
and whether it be a grant or access to a to a partially guaranteed loan, so that you can put that together. Exactly. And then again, you look at that, and just like when you talk about um, Intel or Nike, right, and right. they get a and they get a gain share or a tax break if they create so many jobs, it's right. the same way. Do you yeah, create so yeah. many local jobs? Yeah, it's yeah, the same kind of thing because yeah, yeah. that can drive. If you do it right and it makes sense from a business point of view, you can make it a win-win. Right, if right, you do it right, right. right, if you do it right. Tell you what we'll do. We're gonna take a short break. You've been talking so much. All right, but it's been good though. That's good. I want you. More. We'll probably be another four more hours. All right, thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. I'm here for you. <laughs> did you check? Your, did you did you bring your sleeping room? Yeah, I got it. It's no, right here. It's right there. I got my I got my bedroll. right there. There you go. Hey, we'll take a short break. We'll be right back with Bud. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Again, welcome back to uh, the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Uh, we are we are having the we have the opportunity to interview uh, Bud Pierce, physician, former Marine, Navy, corpsman, awesome. Anyway, he's the candidate. The other candidate is, is Governor Kate Brown. That's her job right now. And the bottom line is that uh, we've already thrown the piece out. Uh, uh, Bud has already suggested that hey, why don't he come over here in the community at the Oregon Voters Digest and Kate could come here and, and you guys could chat with one another and we'll just put out some issues that we agree and then we'll expand. Is that fair? It'd be a great meeting. Oh, awesome. We'd awesome, have awesome. a great time. Awesome, awesome. Well, look, for those of you who, who missed the first portion of the deal, well, check out the time. We're there. We're, on, we're also on Facebook. We're all, well, you'll see some of the pieces on Facebook. We're on YouTube also, too. And the timing is there. That's 24 7. You can get it anytime you want. And then I would suggest very, very strongly that you spend the time to communicate with one another. Your neighbors get together. It's not Republican or Democrat, it's about the issues and how these folks respond to the issues of concerns that we have in this state so that we can have a better life. Economic-wise, love-wise, family-wise, the whole nine yards. That's what we are. And we're fortunate, if you will, in Oregon. We don't have a lot of the major ills like back east right now. It's still our problem. But the fact of the matter is we could set the example and we can do something because we got two great people running. Thank and, you. It, and it is about the issues. It's about the issues. And they're being pressed on all sorts of ways, trust me, on both sides of the aisle. Uh, but, the, but I think we've got two candidates that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, we're going to get the issues. At the end of the day, uh, we're going we're gonna to come out with, we're going to come on the top of this deal. Sounds good. I'm all for it. Good. So, Bud, thank you for sure, being here with sure. us. So now let's go on and continue sure. on. We spent a lot of time on this other piece, but hopefully we, you can come back Absolutely. at times. Absolutely. Anytime. Why don't we, I, what I was going to do, I want to refer to uh, an issue. Uh, some issues that were brought up by the, the our local paper, the Portland Tribune, and they talked about Oregon outlook. Which of the following would you say is the most important problem facing Oregon today, from our perspective? And then some else. But I, I thought they, they shared that in that particular issue. And for those of you who missed that issue, you can go go to Portland Tribune. You can Google it up and whatever. It was Tuesday, July 12th issue, the 12th issue, and it says better off or not, Oregon is divided on the issues poll finds. And so, like I said, they, they identified certain areas here, and I've asked Bud to, to comment on uh, some, of the, some of those. And I'll just briefly just go down. The top was jobs in the economy, education was number two, transportation was number three, immigration was number four, social issues, health care, crime, taxes, environment, gun policy was, oh, gee, way down the line. Racism was almost just, just one, one notch above everything. Interesting. 
Very interesting. interesting with some of the things that are happening. Okay. So what I've done, I've asked Bud, can we go down the list? And, Absolutely. And so we're just going to go down the list and let him respond, and that will be the piece, okay? Then you can compare that with the voters' pamphlet when you get the voters' pamphlet, you see? Now we're talking about issues and solutions. That's what it's all about. Let's go. How about jobs and the economy, Bud? So, again, uh, the dignity of work is the most important thing for a, a person to have a meaningful life. And what we're going to have to do is better training and education, as we discussed, career technical education is very important. Mm -hmm. Government on the side of business, because you have to create the jobs in the private sector. Mm -hmm. If people aren't being paid enough for the work they do because a business isn't prosperous enough, and there are businesses that aren't prosperous enough, you can... Um, what you can do is you can um, uh, cut their state income taxes. Yeah, okay. oh, you can okay. give an earned income tax credit. Okay. You can help with child care because okay. that's huge for yeah. many of the uh, people that are of low income that are working. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure you bring back manufacturing, a natural resource-based economy in which you make end product. I think the best example is the wine industry. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. good to grow the grapes. Mm -hmm. It's better to make the wine. The money's in the wine. Mm. With timber, it's good to cut the trees if you replant them and take care of the environment. Better to make cross laminate timber and plywood you can build skyscrapers out of. You can replace concrete and steel. It's safer for the environment. You can sell a great product. So again, end products out of agriculture are very important. Mm -hmm. And finally, building out the infrastructure. Those are great paying jobs yeah. for Oregon. Mm -hmm. and you get paid 30, 40, 50, 60 bucks an hour to build a freeway lane, mm -hmm. uh, to build a port, build mm -hmm. a bridge, that kind of thing. And if we really focus on those kinds of jobs, we can bring back the kind of jobs that are truly, uh, that give us a middle class and mm -hmm. middle class wages. So mm -hmm. I think that's really the key. Good, good. Okay. How about education? So, we talked a little bit about yeah. that, but, but going on. So again, cradle to grave, and I agree with that, but I would say Pregnant women, make sure they're okay, the baby's okay. First Good two point. years, make okay. sure it's a stable environment. And again, educational reform, copy what other states have done better. There are states that are at the top of the heap. We're, we're way down below. Mm -hmm. We don't need to create a new Oregon mm -hmm. plan. Just copy other mm -hmm. states. Career technical, looks like we're going to fund that if Measure 98 IP65 passes. Um, and the goal must be, at the end of the day, However we do it, and I'm not saying I have the answer to that, but the goal would be that at the end of your first training in education, childhood into young adulthood, that you start off with little or no debt. There's a realistic way for you to do that. Because mm -hmm. you read those horror stories about $1.4 trillion in student debt. You talk about people who have $150,000, oh, 200000 awesome. They don't have a life. Oh. That unacceptable. And that just happened to us in the last 20 or 30 years. It wasn't that way always. Mm -hmm. so, so that's key is, is reform but also the cost issue is very important to the mm -hmm. student. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know, the other thing about that education, Pete, now, are you still going to maintain the uh, the state educator, if you will, as far as the, uh, the superintendent uh, Well, the, the the, currently they're under the, the governor's, governor's direction. Well, I, I'm really more, think about that? I'm more interested in making that, when I think about agency we'll reform, to... I like the idea of an appointed, a truly okay, appointed okay. person who's more of a technocrat mm -hmm. and a very strong agency board, or like a board of directors to help mm -hmm. them. Yeah, when I look at even running for office now, mm -hmm. if someone runs for office of superintendent of schools, they're going to be really beholden to who supports their campaign. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that that's really the best way to go with that. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure we want to create another bureaucracy and elected position. So I'm more for having an excellent educator who has is heading an agency with a strong board that mm -hmm. are agency directors and really have them work more so than maybe going through a political process. I am very worried about who funds the campaign mm -hmm. to get that person elected mm -hmm. is going to have the most clout in mm -hmm. the educational process. I worry mm -hmm. about that mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. a lot. But I still, I still thought that the whole idea of getting rid of Susan Castile, you know, mm -hmm. she was, she mm -hmm. was the superintendent mm -hmm. of schools, and she, I thought she was doing a, a pretty good mm -hmm. job. And she was just there at the beginning with me. All of a sudden, there she was. And all due respect, she was Hispanic. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the, what I saw. In sure, I understand that. I I understand too, that. But that. I worry about the political process. Because you right. and I know oh, yeah. people are very oh. responsive to their donors. Oh, very and much who's so. going to write the biggest check yes, to the person yes, who runs? How yes, are they yes, going to respond? I'm a little yes. worried about that. We have that, we have that problem right here in the Portland. We have that problem. Because, because yeah, all due respect, we don't have, we don't, we've not districtized this. Mm -hmm. And then, so guess who, mm -hmm. who runs the school district? Mm -hmm. And then guess who got us into the lead problem piece? Yep. Look the other way because yep. they didn't want that. They, they, sure. they, they would not provide the bona fide, I guess, it was, uh, filters, if you will, mm -hmm. which we wouldn't have had the problem. But again, the politics mm -hmm. took over. And yeah, so, so if you have the right appointment with the right heart and the yeah. right people working exactly. together, it can work. I think right. that the, the negative of appointing people is they can't be recalled. I exactly. understand that. Yes. But the negative of electing people yes. is who are they going to respond yes. to? So yes, I, yes, I, yes, I kind of yes, like education. Yes. I'd believe it. Yes, you, you, I, I got it. Just a, mm -hmm. just just for just a little side mm -hmm. note aspect of it. Mm -hmm. You seem so relaxed. I mean, you must have some major donors. 
Oh, you your own man. Well, I know, oh, you, man. I know you got the globe. You got yeah, the globe yeah, yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. I know you got that marina. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't actually. It's interesting. I, got to um, see that. I, got to I did about yeah. I did about up to so I, I probably 2.2, 2.3 million total for the campaign. I've actually put in one and a half million of my own money. What? Yeah, I put in one. You put million. your own my own money. Your my own, own money. Time, your, my own money. My own. Money. I didn't loan. I didn't loan it. It's just in there. It's just there. I've done that. Oh, now I see. So I've done that. So therefore, I feel I feel a great freedom. Yes. So no matter what, I can assure you, no one's gonna be a bigger donor to me than myself. I like it. I like so that means that, and the money that I yes, got is because Oregonians allowed yes. me to be a doctor, and right. I and I and I worked hard being a doctor, but they were so generous in, in paying me really. Mm -hmm. So I just owe it to the Oregonians. Yeah, yes. So it's really the Give average citizens who who sent the money to me. So I'm running that way. So I'm gonna end up being my major donor to this campaign. So there, I have other donors that have supported me, but it's mostly small donors. I would say. I have 20, probably 2,500 donors now, vast majority under a couple hundred dollars. Wow, wow. And I have a handful of big donors. Wow. I, I would say less than 10. Wow. Less than 10. Wow. So, so it's mostly Bud Pierce and the small donors wow. and some other donors uh, coming on. Gee, Bud, you're giving back. Uh, I'm like trying that. to. That's trying great. To, trying Good to. job. Okay, I thought I'd throw that one sure, in there. Sure, sure. How about transportation and infrastructure? Again, I think it, I do think we need to go after roads right now. I'm not against light rail. I'm not against bikeways. I'm not a like pedestrian. But you just drive around this this metro area, the tri-county area, it's abysmal. Mm -hmm. We need more lanes of traffic. I think we're the only major city on the West Coast that actually has two lanes of five going through it. Two, two lanes, is, not the whole way, but two lanes. Mm -hmm. Completely inadequate. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, the pressure, I think the answer is we can get some money for infrastructure build out from our general fund and, and such. But I, I kind of like the idea, can we leave what we have free but if we add capacity mm -hmm. and we get investors and private money and wealth funds and all that, could we maybe toll those parts? Because what that does is, uh, let's say on the on the 205, if you have toll lanes running next to the free lanes and it gets backed up, what mm -hmm. tends to happen are the people that can pay will jump off mm -hmm. to the toll lane, mm -hmm. which will get them there faster. But guess what? It gets the regular people there faster too because those people aren't in the lane anymore. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you can structure it so that over time, once it's paid off and the people who invested in it are paid off, it goes back to you. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a powerful way to do that and we're going to need to get more capital and more investment and that's probably a way to look at Now, I, I'm a Westerner. I don't like tolls at all. Yeah, I'd rather yeah. have all the roads open. Okay. But if you can structure it so that what we have now isn't taken away the the new capacity is what we would be talking about and we can get it back after a period of time i think it's something to look into i want you know, the, we need more bridge capacity more lane capacity more airport capacity i mean we're, we're, we're short and we need to go in that direction and those are such great middle class yes, right, jobs right, those right, are just right, right. over the top those are right. jobs that are going to make people happy and you need people that are willing to work hard get some skills work hard and, and they can be employed they can have great lives well, you know, so what, when, when you think about transportation, I think about the CRC, because I'm mm -hmm. River Crossing, mm -hmm. and that boondoggle we just yeah. went through, yeah. and some of those folks are still waiting to do the same thing. Yeah. Hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah, two, about $230, 240000000 million. Yeah, I will thing. point out that our current governor was uh, Secretary of State with oversight uh, and audit function during that time. Didn't do it. Kate. Kate. Governor Kate Brown. Wow. She was also oversight during Cover Oregon. She was also oversight over the boondog of their uh, business energy tax credits. Mm -hmm. She was also oversight over the foster care system. She also has, in a way, oversight over the PERS, although that's separate. I won't yeah, pick yeah, on her yeah, there, yeah, but yeah. she's been there for 25 right, years. Right, right, right. And the PERS system is just completely in a rake. A rise. So I, I appreciate that the, the fact that the governor, when she was Secretary of thought, State, thought motor voter was very important. I think that's important. I, mm -hmm. I, I, every registered voter, I think, could mm -hmm. vote mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. But I think her main duty was audit and oversight, and she was asleep at the wheel. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I would, yeah, I would, sure. I'm going to criticize her yeah. on this oh, yeah. today, yeah. and I'm going to criticize her every day of the campaign. If she was here, she could she, you she know, yeah, yeah. refute it, and that's you, fine. You, she could be right here. Oh so, yeah, exactly. That's so right, we're going right. after it. Yep. Well, like you say, when you yep. when you're getting those donors, you know, and there you go. It could be there an issue. You go. You're right. There you go. Okay. What about uh, we said we was going to talk a little bit about immigration. That's still on the top. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So immigration. So um. In 1986, Ronald Reagan did immigration reform, and the way the reform read was that we would have better border security, we would watch people coming in with visas, uh, we would have processes in place to not let illegal people uh, get employed, um, and, and that we would um, have a pathway to legalization or citizenship for certain people that have been here a long time. So we did all those things, but we really didn't do anything honestly about border security, watching visas, and having any match mm -hmm. of labor needs with mm -hmm. immigrants. Because mm -hmm. what you really want is an economy that is so turned on 
and so needy that you go to other people in other countries and, and you, you welcome immigrants. Because mm -hmm. I think you bring in people, new ideas, new diver and new diversity, all kinds of great things. But if you don't have the work for the people that are here, right, right. you're killing well, people killing. at that, at that right. entry-level job that's work. Right. So in 2007, President Bush had a plan that would be very similar to to what we just talked about. Mm -hmm, right. And that was no from the Democrats, even though he's a Republican. And then 2009, President Obama said exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm, he said exactly mm -hmm. what we're saying yeah, here. Yeah. And again, I think the Senate passed a version, the House couldn't do it. Yeah. It's incumbent upon the federal government to pass immigration policy because it makes a there's a no win yeah. for the states. It's not we can't we don't control it. The governor doesn't control it. So again, the key issues are if you're going to be fair to America's citizens, our match supply of immigrants to jobs. If you don't have jobs, you really don't oh, yeah, need to bring yeah, people yeah, in. That's right, that's right. Make sure your border is secure. Right. I, I, you know, some people say a fence. I think there's a lot of ways to do right, that. Right. Watch people that are here, right. and the government's going to have to make the hard choice about right. um, what to do with the people that are here that have been here sometimes for 20 or 30 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. I mean, the President Bush plan, the Reagan plan, was give a, a pathway to legality, mm -hmm. but government has to decide. Um, and uh, we, we, people have to make the tough decisions. And then, as, as we point out, we have to have good relations with the countries on our border. Mm -hmm. You know, so we don't have a, a large problem with people in Canada coming right, here. Right. And how do we work that out with Mexico yeah. and, and make border it work states, so that yeah, California, so, exactly. Texas, both. So how do we how do we work it out so that it's win win win? Yeah. And that's yeah. what you always try to do. So yeah. those are really the approaches we have okay. to take. Good, good. All right. Uh, let's see. What about health care? Now that's huge. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. Huge. Health it's just huge. I mean, we're, we just passed ten thousand dollars per citizen. In spending and people say that's great we need to spend a lot of money but when you're spending ten thousand dollars per citizen on health care you're not spending it on educating children you're not spending it on helping pregnant women make sure they're safe for the child you're not spending it on those first two years of life you're not spending it on infrastructure you're not mm -hmm. doing it so so there's only a certain amount of money and how do you make that happen so if you look at number the number one thing again the social determinant of health how healthy you are have a job, a good job, yeah. a job you can go to, yeah. something yeah. that motivates you. If you do that, it people are a lot, lot healthier. Yeah, it just, it's, it like, it's a everything. Lot. It's like everything. It's our, our problems, it's yeah, it's so no so problem. That, so that's number one. The second thing is, is in the delivery system mm -hmm. where you get your care, we're going more and more to monopoly delivery systems. What I mean is there's one hospital, usually based system, that delivers the care in the area. Portland actually has multiple. And actually, Portland prices are kept down by that. You got OHSU, Providence, yeah, Legacy. Yeah, yeah, right, right. But I'll tell you, a lot of places out there, there's one. And if you look at one delivery system, generally the cost of those identical services are about a third higher because right. monopolies always yeah, charge right, more. Right, right. I mean, uh, they always uh, say they charge less, but yeah, they always charge more. more. Mm -hmm. The next thing is, is how do you, what kind of system do you have to have some competition? Okay. I think a lot of us want to have as we think about this, a lot of us kind of want to go the public route. We would just say we want to be guaranteed, we want to know what we're getting. And so there's something called the CCO, the Coordinated Care Organization, which is out there. It was Governor Kitzhaber's idea. A pot of money goes regionally, and that's to pay for right now uh, the health care of poor people or Medicaid Oregon Health Plan for hospitals for medical, for dental, and mental health. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine saying to people, okay, you have a choice. You can go into your local CCO, mm -hmm. which will be spelled out exactly what you get. Mm -hmm. It'll be run by a local board. Mm -hmm. It'll be, it could be nonprofit, a lot of them are profit. It could be either way. Mm -hmm. And that's the choice. The other choice you have is a vibrant um, insurance system. Mm -hmm. One that we, has lots more options, that has a lot more innovation, and they'll spell out what they have, but it's not gonna be the CCO. Right. And I think the hope would be that you would have that private part that would compete with the public part and drive innovation. Because whenever you get a big private issue, mm -hmm. it's a little bit hard. Even in the public schools, a lot of the states that have good public schools have a uh, vigorous competing system. They have academies. Uh, they might have um, uh, some uh, sis schools like that that compete with even within right, the public right, system. Right. So That's you got to have some, co some right. competition some, yeah. to do that. So I think oh, a lot yeah. of us, when we think about education reform, we're thinking about using that CCO as what people can choose. Private insurance is one. Get people working, they'll be healthier. Encourage people to work into their later mm -hmm. age, as we discussed mm -hmm. earlier, because that'll mm -hmm. keep them healthy. And don't have monopolistic delivery systems, because they're always more expensive. And again, if you get out of Oregon, if you had another half a million people working, and remember, we have four million Oregonians, three million working age, two million jobs, one and a half million full time. Right. If you got another half a million working, you would improve their health, and you'd have a lot more resources to spread around the cost of insurance. And I think that's where we're ultimately a way to take that on okay okay you know one area especially in this area mm -hmm. we have we, we can really have issues we mm -hmm. got issues in what homelessness oh yeah and then naturally uh, around the world around the country for that matter <coughs> heroin is now the the, the the drug of choice so to speak we we've uh, we, we've legalized marijuana yeah. so yeah. you got to pay for that yeah. you know what i mean but yeah. now we've got marijuana we got a heroin aspect of it we got a problem yeah I so mean, 
Maybe yeah. not as much in, in Salem. Do you have a, a homeless Ooh, problem? Oh, yeah, one of the main reasons I got involved yes. in this campaign at this time was right. when I drive to work, the ever-increasing number of mostly men, some women, spilled in out Salem. of the mission into the local parks and in the streets. And I went to a uh, kind of a community organization to help children in education. I found out in the Salem-Kaiser area, a thousand children a night do wow. not have a place to sleep that are wow. school age. Wow. How can we even have one? Wow. I mean, how can one child? Wow. And so, and I've been educating this. I spent some time in, in, the, in what we call the houseless camps, because mm -hmm. again, we've, we're being educated in terminology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The earth is I our home yeah, yeah, right, right. and the house houseless, is your shelter. Houseless, yes. but, but again, we need to have zero tolerance on yeah. ourselves to yeah. allow people to live in that situation. Yeah. And yeah. when you go in there, some, some situations when you look at mental health laws yeah. right now we have danger to self or others we need to have need to treat so if someone's out of control mental illness drug addiction don't know where they are how they're behaving we need to have laws in place to pull them out and put them into humane shelter and the minute and when they're in humane shelter they get their mental illness treated they, they get substance abuse programs are put in place and right away right away they start having a task in that in that area because you're mm -hmm. not trying to create dependency mm -hmm. you're trying to create independency mm -hmm. or independent people so right away they have a responsibility some part they have to contribute mm -hmm. um, and then you, you look at what do they need to get employed and mm -hmm. whether it's job training or skills and build that great economy with great jobs and uh, then you can get people out of their houselessness, yeah, yeah. out of their mental illness, and get them to be contributing members of society. And that's got to be the goal. You've really healed someone when they can work. Mm -hmm. When they can work, they're healed. If they can't work, they're not fully healed. And when you, if you're gonna, if you're gonna integrate all of society together and bring them together, once they can work and they have a great job, you have achieved what people really need. That is the end result. A great job for every Oregonian. Uh, all of them is my goal. Got to eat. Got to eat. I don't give. Got to eat. Regardless of what level you are, gotta you got to eat. Got to eat. Got to eat. <laughs> eat. I want people eating well. <laughs> eating well. Well, look, we got about a we got about a minute. Mm -hmm. About a minute. Why don't you just wrap it up by giving maybe a, a lasting comment to the voting artists out there? Let me look that way or to look, you? We can look, look at me. All right. Keep on. Let's just okay, keep, okay, okay, let's right. keep talking. So, um, what, so what, the, the, what I think people should know is if you want a servant leader. Okay. Someone who absolutely wants to elevate the citizen, looks at their needs, their aspirations, their hopes, and put government at its, the citizen's feet and answer to them is transparent and helpful and focuses on the citizen like a good doctor focuses on the patient, any good medical practice, then you vote for Bud Pierce for governor. If you want a servant governor, if you want a government of service, then I'm your guy. But it's been great. This has been fantastic. Thank you. Really, I appreciate really being I mean, here. That. It's been enjoyable. I mean, you, you've got the enthusiasm. I like I like that enthusiasm. Thank you. You know what I'm saying? And um, your makeup uh, in terms of you're prepared to run for the office, mm -hmm. uh, you, you're basically committing yourself by basically putting your retirement. You give it back. Put it out there. And, and your whole your whole philosophy about mm -hmm. the whole issue of education. Mm -hmm. Hopefully now we might be able to get out of this issue of, of going along that same course mm -hmm. of basically putting people in a situation they can't come out. Correct. And it's very so my point is I appreciate that. Thank Again, you. thank you very much, bud. Thanks for having we me. Have you back. Can we have I you will back? be back. You, good you call me, I'll be here. I sure will. All right, again, thank bud. you very much. Thanks well, folks, you. there you had it. There's thank Bud. You. Thank you. Now you can check thank out you. his voters' pamphlet and whatever. Right. But that's that's a very important piece. You need to know the person. That's why we spent so much time with him. We're going to have him back. Again, take care. Have a good one. I'll see you next week. Take care.